My name is Colin Harold Harrison. I was born on the 28th of September 1939 in Grangetown, Cardiff, South Wales, UK. My role on the Rurik was one of 14 engineers. I was a junior fifth engineer. I was 21 at the time. The Runic is a 13,500 tonne fully refrigerated cargo ship, which was unusual for ships in those days to be fully refrigerated. The biggest at the time she was built in 1950. The purpose of the Runic was to take general cargo from the United Kingdom out to Australia and New Zealand and then return with chilled beef and lamb to the UK. It's on the ship for about a month to six weeks before it was wrecked. The Runic was wrecked because of a mistake made by the deck officer in charge of plotting the course of the Runic in the time when we were supposed to arrive in that area. Well, we, we hit the reef at about one or two o'clock in the morning. What happened was that we left Brisbane after being there for about a week. We were supposed to reach the a break in the Great Barrier Reef where we could pass through at a specific time in the morning, early in the morning of that day. All ships at that time, most of them had radar. Unlike today, radar is on 24 seven. But back in those days, you only put the radar on when you thought you needed it. They knew that to find this break in the reef for us to pass through, they'd need the radar. But when we left Brisbane, we set course, the Barrier Reef, and it would be several hours before you got there. It was the job of the deck officer to figure out what time we were going to arrive there, right? And then the idea was that the deck officers would put the radar on, find the gap in the reef, and we'd sail straight through it. What happened was that the officer that was responsible for the charting of the course to the reef made a mistake on the actual time because, as you appreciate, between one part of Australia and heading to New Zealand, the actual time of day changes, right? And so they have to log the changes and show them up on, on where we, to make sure we know where we are at any given time during the day. And they've made a mistake of what time we were going to arrive there. In fact, it was a one hour difference. So at 12 o'clock, the deck watch changes and the engineering watch changes and the deck officers were up on the bridge but in the chat house having a cup of tea or coffee or whatever it was they were drinking it would have been only tea or coffee and they were discussing the day's operations the day before and they weren't really taking any notice of what was going on you must remember that you have a helmsman on on, on the wheel, he's, he's watching what's going on, and they dispatched the apprentice to the wing of the bridge and told him to keep watch. It was his job to keep watch. And he, he wasn't a new apprentice, he was a fairly experienced one. The helmsman said to the apprentice, it looks like we've got breakers ahead. And the apprentice said, no, they're only whitecaps. Helmsman was a seaman of some, what, 20 odd years of being a helmsman. And he said to him, I'm telling you, that's breakers ahead. And the apprentice wouldn't take any notice of him because he thought he was having him on. And as you can appreciate that on, uh, on a ship like that where you've got all these guys around, it, it's going on all the time. You know, it, it, one having a go at another or something like this. And the apprentice really thought that he was having him on. And he couldn't see, he didn't know the difference between breakers and whitecaps. Uh, but this guy did. In the end, the guy threatened that if he didn't go get the mates who were talking in, 
in the chat room, he didn't get them, he would leave his post, which was an absolute no-no for a helmsman to do. He would leave the post and go and get them himself. So in the end, the, the, the apprentice said, all right, I'll go and get them. So he went and he said that, and told them, the helmsman reckons his break is ahead. They, of course, also thought that they were being uh, Mickey taken out of them. They came out and had a look. And of course, he was right. By the time they moved the telegraph from full ahead to full astern, we were hitting the reef. Because, as they found out later, we were one hour ahead of whatever way it is. We, we'd arrived at the reef a lot, lot be, one hour before we were supposed to, according to the, to the course chat. So that's how come we ended on the reef. I was in bed. I suddenly found myself up against the forward bulkhead of my cabin, splattered against it because she'd suddenly come to a stop and we kept going. I was already getting into my boiler suit to go down into the engine room when the emergency glaxons went off. The engine room staff were coming out and saying we're going down, but I still went down to the manoeuvring platform where all the operations of the engine room take place. It was like being in a very fast lift, going from a very high building to the ground, fast. And it was going down really fast like that. All the weight was in the stern and nothing in the front. Of course, we were worried that it'd go down far enough for us to, to have problems with flooding in the engine room. We stayed there and settled the engines and waited for instructions from the bridge as to what they wanted to do. And we spent that day trying to pull the ship off with the ship's engines. The captain was told not to do that because if he did, it might make the situation worse. And it did. It took us side on to the reef instead of being out away from the reef. The captain of the ship was in a about the worst place that any captain of a ship wants to be in. Nobody wants to be, no captain wants to be in charge of a ship that runs into serious difficulty of which he, he can't control, right? And to run up on a reef in, um, in this situation at the time was the worst thing that could happen to, to the captain of the ship. So. It was not unreasonable to believe that he wasn't handling it really well, mm -hmm. okay? Luckily f for us, there are uh, several deck officers and they were able to smooth a lot of things over, but he was very anxious about what was happening because he had a crew of people under his charge and right at that moment, it looked like we were going to be in big trouble. But it, as I said, throughout the whole incident, the worst we had was somebody cut his finger and, uh, and had to have a band-aid put on it. So, uh, but even so, the captain, the captain was a reasonable guy, but in a very bad situation. And he didn't handle it as well as some people may have. So all operations were ceased at that point. So the engine room, as far as we're concerned, went into a standby mode. And we all decided we'd just go and have a break out on deck having a few drinks. And the captain decided to uh, set off a distress rocket. We're looking up at the bridge. They placed the rocket in the cylinder ready to go. And the bridge is completely engulfed in smoke. There's flame, smoke, everything disappears. You could just see through the smoke, the flame of the rocket as it just lifted up high enough to go over the railing of the ship straight into the water. That was considered to be the best entertainment we'd had in days. Danger level wasn't that high because uh, you don't, a ship doesn't sink when it's on a reef, it sits on top of it. So there's no real danger there. As far as I know, the only person, the only thing that happened uh, was somebody needed a, 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 a lastoplast on a, on a finger that they got caught somewhere. 
That's about all. Uh, there, was, there wasn't any injuries or anything like that. For the six weeks that we're on there, it's situation as normal. You just run the ship as normally you would. And in between times, you're doing all these things to get it off. There was several incidents on the ship that happened that were, would not normally happen in such a situation. And one of them was that we needed the lifeboats to be used for transportation. So we needed to tie two of the lifeboats together to make the platform on them for transportation. But before we could do all that, we needed the motorized lifeboat to be working. So on the second day that we we're on there, the captain decided to put the motorized lifeboat into the water and test it. But before, it, before you put a lifeboat in the water, you must have it fully crewed. That's uh, a deck officer, an engineer to run the motor, and eight crewmen for rowing if you need it. The engineer told the deck officer not to cast off until he actually got the engine running. That was where it failed. They, they cast off the boat before he got it going and because of the swell that was hitting the side of the boat, the lifeboat fell away from the ship very quickly before anybody could get, another, get a, a line onto it. The engineer, of course, couldn't start the motor because it hadn't been started for some time and had problems. So then they decided that they would row the boat, they would start rowing the boat. Well, that turned out to be a complete disaster because they could not get the crew to coordinate the rowing. So all this time, the lifeboat was travelling towards the reef and was in danger of hitting the reef and maybe break it up. Because at this time in a situation, it was looking a bit desperate, they called the fearless in and the fearless came down and fired two rocket lines at the boat, which missed the boat and were laying quite a bit along, one along each side of the boat where they couldn't get to them. So the situation now was that the this boat is hitting the reef, the lines are there, they couldn't get to them, and it looked like it was going to be the f a first major disaster of the reef hitting the reef. So what happened was, there was this chap on that had joined the ship in Brisbane that was a diver for Mother of Pearl up in Queensland, and he just dived over the wall and swum to the boats. Meanwhile, while he's swimming the boat, the boats, there's this uh, school of sharks swimming round him while he while he was swimming to the boat. But he just kept going, and he got it was a fair distance. He got got to the boat. He picked up one of the lines, took it to the boat, and they tied it on the front, and the feelers turned and pulled them off. But it was an incredible feat in two ways. One. He knew those shacks were in the water before he went in. And two, the distance he had to swim, even in, in roughish waters. And he did both without any worries at all. After he got back, we asked him why he, he was prepared to do that with all them shacks in the water. And he said, I'm used to shacks. The shacks, you have a look around the reef, you can see all this uh, fish there. Uh, plenty and they're well fed and he said that as long as I kept a nice smooth strokes that uh, that didn't disturb them uh, they wouldn't they, it's something new they wouldn't know what it was they wouldn't want to attack so the whole incident was saved just by one man Fearless was an ocean going tug uh, she was the, the first one to arrive on the reef. She arrived about three to four days after we hit and uh, her job was to try to help us pull us off the reef, which uh, first attempts didn't, didn't do any good. Yeah, I, I can 
A condenser is a heat exchanger. It takes heat out of one water and puts it into something else or something like that. And on, on those turbines, we have these large condensers. When the steam goes through the turbine, the water is then condensed back to ordinary water from steam. And to do that, you circulate seawater around the outside of the condenser to cool it. So you take the heat out of the steam and turn it back to water. When we hit the reef, about two, two or three days afterwards, we were hit by very heavy seas that were hitting the side of the ship. And it was hitting with quite a bit of force. So what happened was that the junior engineer that was on watch that night heard something happen in the engine room and he couldn't, he didn't want to go and investigate on his own, but he could hear a heck of a lot of water coming into the engine room. So he came up and got me to go down with him and we went and had a look and we found, I went underneath the engine, which is quite easy to get under there, and I could see this huge volume of water coming out of, out of the turbine condenser into the engine room and we, we called everybody else down to shut, shut it down to, to fix it. So what we had to do was we had to take the seawater which we have taken from one side of the ship to cool the condenser and put it uh, and then take it from the other side of the ship so as we could shut that side down. And what had happened was because that side was open to the sea and the sea was coming in and hitting the ship really hard, the water went down through the inlet pipes into the condenser and blew the condenser door open. Uh, blew it blew a great big hole in the condenser door and the condenser door was three four inches thick and it just shows what kind of a, a, a strength the sea actually has it, when it hits a, a, an immovable object it just smashed this door right out we shut everything down settled it down pumped the, the water out from the engine room and we had a spare door, so we just put another door on there so that we could continue operations. That's what happened with the condenser. Like I say, there was several incidents on there of things going wrong. We, the other incident that involved me that could have involved a bit of danger was the donkey boiler, which was a Cochrane donkey boiler. And the donkey boiler is the boiler that you have on when you're in port, because you don't have the main boilers on then, you have a donkey boiler on to supply steam for, for cooking, for uh, all kinds of things around the ship that you use steam for. And that's on 24-7 when you're, when you're in a port. One of the jobs of the engineers on the ship is to maintain, see to it that the operation of that boiler along with all the other equipment in the engine room is maintained at a proper standard. Today those boilers are automatic boilers. Uh, you just connect water to it, connect oil to it, fire it up and away it goes and, and makes steam for you. And it does everything automatically, keeps its water up and all that. Well on this Cochrane boiler it was necessary for the fireman or the engineer that was on watch to maintain the water level in the boiler. It, you, had to, you had to be on top of it all the time because some minutes there'd be very little steam used and there'd be nothing used out of the boiler. Other minutes there'd be a lot going out of it. So you'd have to keep the water level at the correct level. What happened was that after we'd been on the reef there for a couple of weeks, the people who were supposed to be looking after the engine room and the boiler were getting a bit lax in what they were doing. So they used to take it in turns to go for a sleep. The fireman did about four hours of the watch, that night watch. He then said to the junior engineer, you look after it, I'll go and have a kip now, which they'd done several times already, quite a bit. But the junior engineer simply went to sleep himself. And of course, the boiler, lost all its water. Now, uh, uh, the boiler is like 
two egg cups, say two halves of an egg, one top, top of the other, and in between is uh, water, and that's how you put an oil burner underneath, you boil the water, and that's where the steam's made between the two egg, the space between the two eggs, halves of the egg. The water went out of the boiler, the burner is still going, it heated the inside crown of the boiler as we call it, cherry red, and that simply dropped straight down in, in front of the access door. If you, you, you had an access door which you could look into the chamber in, like you know, and it just went straight down. I saw I'm in bed, the junior engineer comes up and says, got a problem with the donkey boiler. And I said, oh, what's that? He said, well, when you open up the access door, there's metal there. I'm half asleep and I'm thinking, this guy's nuts. Like, you know, it, it, it just doesn't happen. And when I, I, I turned to, went down to the engine room, opened the door, and he's right. There's metal in front of it. And I knew what had happened straight away then. And I said to him, it's run out of water. The crown has collapsed. And uh, I went and got the second engineer, he looked, so we had to put the main boiler on then to look after the steam services. While I was on the, uh, on the ship, about, about a week or two later, the super chief engineer of the, the company came on board. And the first thing he wanted to do was uh, come down and have a look at the boiler. And I was in the engine room when he came down and he... He, um, we looked at the boiler together and he said we were bloody lucky that it didn't explode. Had it done so, uh, all the engineers were living in the accommodation a bit above it. I, I find, find it hard to believe that uh, it could explode, but he seemed to think it would, but it didn't. We got out of it, but again, just simply because of a mistake, a silly mistake made by somebody. The whole thing was because of silly mistakes made by people, but nobody got hurt from it. When we were on the reef, we had a deep sea diver who went down to find out exactly the state of the ship before we tried to pull her off with chunks and stuff like that. Now, the ship has two, two hulls, virtually. There's the outer hull, and inside is what we call the double bottom tanks, they form a, a second seal and you put, you make tanks in there and carry uh, water, oil, stuff like that in there. The reason that we were going down in this lift was because when we hit the reef, this pinnacle of rock had entered one of those tanks which was only had ballast water in it and uh, all that water was being let out of the tank. And that's why the ship was going down in the stern, because all the weight was in the stern and nothing in the front. And this diver used to go to, down and have a look and find out what was how the ship was, so that if we pulled it off, it would float. Every ship is, is built so that it can float on its double bottom tanks if it has to. Right? And, um, we had to be sure that it could do that. That's part of what I was doing, checking the, the tops of the tanks to see there was nothing wrong with them when I was connecting up air to blow the water out of them. The diver used to go down on the side, uh, on the side of the ship and it was a huge groper in a, in a hole down there, right alongside where he had to go. So every time he went down, he used to take used to take sausages or something like that and just drop them into the groper's mouth and then the groper would be happy, wouldn't bother him any. <laughs> so things like that were going on on the reef all the time. But there was nothing really dangerous in, act, in action. It was just a normal ship's activity while we were on there that six weeks, except for all this stuff going on on deck where they were getting ready for the actual salvage attempt. There was... And, and nobody really was put out that much. We did lose a bit of our stores at first, were depleted, but they were soon replaced by ships coming out to us 
company ships every, every a lot of shore salmon line boats were uh, around Australian coast at that time and it, they used to stop by and refuel us and do, do all kinds of things for us and then take off again. I was listening to the news on, the, on a radio, not the television, but radio, <laughs> and it came over that the Runic had gone aground on Middleton Reef. We didn't have much information given to anybody. It was more traumatic in the UK because it had been announced that the Runic had sunk and all crew were lost. And that was a shock. I never knew anything about that. I was told about that later on. We had to lighten the ship as much as we could. The seals on the hold were made by large RSJs, which were placed across the hold and were wrapped in lead. So these cross members were all picked up and placed on the reef alongside of the ship. Bad weather swung us back onto the reef. And of course, straight on to all these RSJs that we put on the reef, they punctured the hold of the ship. That's when the abandon the ship was decided because it was absolutely useless. Had we pulled it off, she would have just sunk. The ab ab abandoning the ship was a decision that came after we'd been on it about six weeks trying to, to pull it off. What they were doing, they, were, they brought out anchors, big compressors, my job was to try and find the vents to the tanks, the double, no, double bottom tanks, and connect compressors up to it so that we could put compressed air in and blow the water out of the tanks to make the ship lighter. They took anchors, they used the lifeboats that were tied together to take anchors out away from the ship and drop them out and they, con they were connected up to some very large rope blocks. Our front winches were on one and our back winches were on the other. And the idea was that they put weight on it, on, on the lines, on the anchors. They also, we'd also had a second tub turn up. So we tried, they tried then with the two tugs and the anchors to try and and the ship's engines going in astern to try and pull it off. But it didn't work because the anchors couldn't grab hold on the seabed. They was too soft. All they did was just dig into it and return back to the ship. So that didn't work. So we, we tried that twice. Uh, and then that was in the, towards the end of the, the second attempt was about a day before we actually got into real serious trouble. That didn't work, so they were going to try and get an, another tug. But that night, we were hit by weather that was extreme at the, at the worst. And it was like, in the engine room, it's like a million ton hang, hammer hitting the side of the ship. And very noisy, very dangerous. It split the ship or it bent the ship's side in completely and the main rib of the ship would be a very large RSJ was, was bent like an S by this C hitting it. We tried that night to keep the water level down but we couldn't uh, with the pumps. We got to remember that to have the pumps working we had to have a generator working, a steam generator, and we had to have boiler, a large boiler working because uh, to give it steam and all that. All that equipment had to be running to maintain the ship's operation. Well, once the water got up as high as the generator, the, con the commutator on the generator, once it got close to that, the chief electrician shut it down because it could have caused fire through all the through all the wiring in the ship so we had to shut it down and that's when it was decided we would have to abandon the ship because there was no way that it was going to sail or float if we pulled it off we were taken off the ship by another company ship the amv arabic 
Well, when we came off the ship, some of the officers were taken to the to a hotel to stay in. The remainder of us were put up in HMAS Penguin in Sydney, and we were there for about a week or something like that. And British soccer team had come out to play a tour, tour out in Australia, and they'd come out on a Bristol Britannia plane, which was supposed to return empty to the UK. But because we were there and we were available, we got to ride back, got to fly back on that plane. Well, his first hop was from uh, Australia to, uh, from Sydney to uh, Calcutta known as Mumbai today, I believe, at uh, Calcutta, yeah, and that was about an eight-hour run. We are about six hours into it when I was looking out of the port, I was on that side, all of a sudden, flame, smoke and everything started coming out of the outer engine. So I nudged the guy next to me and I said to him, Jimmy, I told you, smoking is not good for you, is it? And he said, no, because he was half asleep. And I said, it's not good for that engine out there either. And he looked, he, oh my God. It's, and, and all the crew then got to find out what was going on. And they're all looking. And the chief steward on the chief cabin guy that on, the, on the ship came, came up and said, look guys, you're all on one side of the aeroplane. Would you mind how you getting back on the other side? And we said, yeah, that's okay. And he said, look, it's nothing to worry about. And... We said to him, well, no, we're not worried about it, um, but we'd all like a beer if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> so we all had a beer and watched this engine, but they, they smothered it and put it out. As they told us afterwards, it wasn't really dangerous. They, uh, well, it was dangerous, but uh, they could handle it because the plane could fly on one engine and it had three more to go, so, uh, so it wasn't really that bad. They couldn't understand why we weren't really upset about it. As they said, on a, a normal flight, they probably would have had a mutiny on their hands. And you guys didn't seem to worry about it. They were told, yeah, we're the Runic crew. We've been on the, on the reef there for six weeks. We're not worried about an engine catching fire. It took Colin about six months to get a, a single passage out here, so it would be about 12 months before we saw each other again. It was good to have him home. To this day, there's not much of it left at all. I believe there's still a bit of the stern of the ship there. It's a part of your life that was part of it, that nobody likes to see a big ship like that get into that kind of problem, but... You just have to live with it, don't you? Always remember when you get into situations like this, especially when you do have time, to get your camera out and take some photographs. On my previous trip, I had lots of photographs of the things that we did, but absolutely nothing about what happened on that roof and I was on it for six weeks. <laughs>